Uh, you are made to multiply. At the heart of what it is to be human is to be part of God's ever-expanding and life-giving mission to the world. That sounds a bit grand, doesn't it? But it's true. Let me show you. After God gives life and creates mankind from the dust in Genesis 1.26, he gives them a life-giving mission to do. Something like what he has done in creation himself. He commissions Adam and Eve to be founders of a creative project, a mission to the world beyond Eden to a dusty land of opportunity. Genesis 1, 27 through 28 says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. He made them out of the dust and now he says, go, have kids, build communities, take the seeds and the fruitfulness I have given you and expand into the dust beyond. Bring life to the lifeless, just as I have made you from the dust. As you do it, work, rest, produce, and do it all with great care, looking after one another and the creation around you, all to Yahweh's glory. When we think about the mission of God, I think we often begin with the great commission that Jesus gave us. But actually this cultural mandate, that's what this is, is where we should really begin. Because it gets to the essence of who we are as human beings. It helps us to see that the mission God calls us to as a church is not some attempt to draw people into attending a church meeting on a Sunday. It's about seeing people discover what it really means to be truly human. An image bearer receiving life from the life giver himself and then sharing that life with the world around us. That is the essence of what the church is. You could describe life in Eden as a church plant. God was planting the first of many communities that were to expand across the earth with a little church planting team of Adam and Eve. Take what I've given you and fill the earth with my goodness. It says something about God's heart. To look on barren people and places with a passion to bring life. That is, that is who God is. He sees opportunity in the barren places and says, I want to bring life to that. I want to make it flourish. At the heart of what it means to be human is to image God and to build life-giving communities that steward all that God has given us. And that is really good news because it means that in the mundane when you're not in a meeting like this and praising God and, and sensing his presence with you with great power, that's amazing. We want that. That's a, that's, a, that's a massive part of it. That's actually at the heart of it. But even in the mundane, sometimes frustrating and very ordinary things of life, we join in the purposes of God for the world. From picking toys off the floor and washing dishes to cutting the grass. And looking out for the elderly neighbour. We are somehow playing a part in the mission of God. Trying to bring about communities that image God. That love well. That care for one another. That build each other up. That help each other to, to be all that they were made to be. It's God of all creation wraps up our purposes in his. We are made to represent him and his interests in the world. And the closer we get to that, the closer we get to what it means to be human. And although God made us all in his image, he also made us unique. Each of us have a unique offering to bring 
to this mission. King David tells us, God knitted each of us together in our mother's womb. The prophet Isaiah describes us as clay in the potter's hand, handmade, not mass-produced. The Apostle Paul says we are God's workmanship and he has for us good works that he has prepared for us to do. The church is to be a body with many parts, each of us vital in the way that God has uniquely gifted us. So if you're here and you're thinking, ah, building the church is about the people up front, or it's about the people who are leading church planting teams, it's about the people who are leading the, the hospitality, whatever it is. Well, it is, but it's also about you. Each one of us with a unique offering to bring. Pastor and writer Eugene Peterson puts it this way. And let's just remember, it's not just what we do on a Sunday. Let's keep that in mind. Pastor and uh, writer Eugene Peterson, he says this. The Bible makes it clear that every time there is a story of faith, it is completely original. God's creative genius is endless. He never fatigued and unable to maintain the rigors of creativity resorts to mass producing copies. Each life is a fresh canvas on which he uses lines and colors, shades and lights, textures and proportions that he has never used before. We see what is possible. Anyone and everyone is able to live a zestful life that spills out of the stereotyped containers that a sin-inhibited society provides. Such lives fuse spontaneity and purpose and green with desiccated landscape with meaning. And we see how it is possible. By plunging into a life of faith, participating in what God initiates in each life, exploring what God is doing in each event. I wish I had that way with words. <laughs> he has a unique offering to bring. Sadly, the heart of what it means to be human was tarnished in every way at the fall in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, they choose to try and do it their own way and with tragic consequences. The separation from this life-giving presence of Eden and thrown out of the garden. They're separated from God. There is surely no hope without it. Where, what about this life-giving seed? Where, is it, where are they going to get it from? Now they're in the barren place without access to the very thing that was going to bring life to the barren place. How on earth are they now supposed to fulfill what God has made them to be? Surely it is impossible. Surely they are cut off forever. Surely this is it. Surely humanity is doomed. But praise God, he looks on barren places and people and he desires life. He didn't look down and think, oh dear, oh, guys, you've really messed up. I don't know what you're going to do about this one. Yeah, I, we'll just have to wait and see, but it doesn't look good for you guys. It doesn't look down from heaven like that. In the same way that he created all things by the power of his word, by his breath, he speaks. He speaks into creation and he speaks grace. It's his initiation. Where it was impossible for us, it is possible for God. And he begins with a promise. He reveals to himself, himself, to an old man. A man named Abraham and his wife Sarah. They lived in a place called the Ur among the Chaldeans. And um, they were a bit of a hopeless case. They didn't have kids well into their old age. And in those days, that's what that meant because it was so associated with everything that would cause you to prosper in old age. And God chose them. And he said to them, he said to Abraham, Genesis 12, that he would make him a blessing to the nations, that they would be a couple who are used to build a nation that would bless the nations. Every type would gather and it would be such a huge number that you couldn't even count them. Sarah laughed. 
And you would, wouldn't you? I mean, this is ridiculous. I'm ancient. I can't begin a nation. What are you talking about, Lord? This is mad. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you look out at the city and you think, man, 1% of people going along to a Bible-believing church. All the trends are going down. Even the blessing of this church is actually a result of a declining Christianity. <laughs> How am I supposed to do anything about this? I look at all my friends and I think they're just not interested. But with God, anything is possible. And he's done it before and he can do it again. Through Abraham and Sarah, God's mission was kick-started. And as we flick through the pages of the Old Testament, we see more and more of this hope that is revealed. They looked hopeless, but hope is revealed again and again and again. Hope that a saviour and judge would come to release us all from slavery to sin. That's what we see in stories like the Exodus. The law showed hope would come in one who could really live up to its demands. The sacrificial system revealed hope would come through a once and for all sacrifice. The promised land pointed to a future place of life like the one that we saw in Eden. The kingdom of Israel pointed to hope coming in a king from David's line. A king who would reign and rule with benevolence. The prophets declared hope would be fulfilled with justice and peace through the work himself. And there's so much more in there. The first two chapters of John's biographical account of Jesus announces hope in a glorious way. It says the word himself, the one who spoke the word world into creation, who was with God in the beginning and was actually God, became flesh and dwelt among us. He was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, says John. Emmanuel, God with us. The life of Eden had arrived through God himself. We couldn't find our way back to dwelling with God. But by miraculous conception, God came to us. Happy Christmas, right? We needed God incarnate. Who lived the way Adam didn't, couldn't. Jesus lived a life more truly human than anyone else who has ever lived. The perfect image bearer on mission for God. And Jesus' faithfulness to that mission took him to the cross. The Christ, the living temple of God, was taken outside of the holy city of Jerusalem. He was banished from the life-giving presence of God. That's why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He died alone so we could walk with God. And he did it so we could be given Eden-like purpose and presence. Be restored to what it truly is to be a human being. And then on the third day, after his crucifixion, the women who are uh, part of his followers came down with spices and ointments. And they thought they'd seen a gardener. But he was more than a gardener. Just like Adam was supposed to be more than a gardener. This gardener was the gardener of a new creation, but he was also the great high priest that had been the true and final sacrifice to fulfill God's sure and certain promises to return us to the presence of our maker. Jesus spends 40 days with his disciples and the other followers and he gives them a new commission. Similar to the cultural mandate we saw in Genesis 1. This one, the Great Commission, says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then before Jesus ascends, he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And that is exactly what happens. There's this big festival called Pentecost in Jerusalem. And the people looked on in amazement as all kinds, all types, people from all kinds of nations are beginning to be filled with the Spirit. And they speak in all kinds of languages. And then bumbling, inconsistent, denying Peter stands up and he preaches a bold message to thousands. The church was born and immediately the power of the Holy Spirit overflowed out of them onto the streets of Jerusalem. Just like Adam and Eve were supposed to advance out of Eden around the world with the life-giving presence of God, the Spirit was poured out on these people to go to Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see this? Jesus, the one who, is, who has lived a life more truly human than anybody else, is actually restoring humanity to us. He is showing us what it is to be a life-giving presence on the earth as we are hidden in him in the mission of God. Eden life flows in the church. You can now make disciples across the world. And that is the era that we live in. We are to establish communities of life. We are to establish places of blessing in barren places. Go on mission. Go church planting. The Apostle Paul says that we, the church, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, are co-workers with God. We're hidden in the mission of God. Our, our mission is hidden in his mission. Our purpose is in his purposes. We, the church, have a task to do. And so at Glasgow Grace, we're trying to work that out in all kinds of different ways. And I, I'm going to get into some practical stuff in a moment that I really hope will help us to know what it is to be empowered by God to go and be on mission in this city and beyond. Uh, we have grace communities throughout the week and they're in people's homes and they're kind of smaller groups of about 10 to 15. And then we have our gathering here on a Sunday but we don't just want to have six grace communities forever and we don't want to just have one gathering forever in fact we see that this gathering is the beginning of what we hope will happen in the future which is that we will then see another gathering happen on a sunday uh, down in the southeast of glasgow and then from there hopefully we see again and again and again more and more gatherings of people who love Jesus and who are on mission together to bring life to all these different areas of Glasgow. We want to see this city filled with communities that are all about discovering what it means to be truly human. And that, that can only happen through Jesus, by his word and in the power of his Holy Spirit. So, we have a couple of different ways that I think are going to be key to us doing this. One is to be spirit-filled, and the other is to be willing to do this like Christ did with sacrifice. It's going to take both those things. When Jesus uh, was at the Feast of Pentecost, there was this moment at the most important day of the feast, and he stands up. He says that uh, out of us will flow rivers of living water. 
And actually, it's a reference back to Eden, ultimately. Because out of Eden, there's these four rivers, and the life-giving presence of God was dwelling with his people. And Jesus was saying, I'm going to restore that. I'm going to bring something of that. And John then even explains right after he says it that we are going to be, that the church is going to be filled with the Spirit. He was talking about the Spirit to come. And since Pentecost, every believer has been able to access that presence of God. And so in a moment, we are going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. And we are going to ask that if you are somebody who would like to be filled with the Spirit, that you go for prayer at the back. A whole bunch of us are just going to pray for you. Because we believe that if you want to see some extraordinary things happen in your life, if you want breakthroughs to happen, if you, want your, if you want to increasingly see your boldness increase in the way that you share this good news, if you increasingly want to know what it is to live in freedom, then you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, if we do it in our own strength, we're going to burn out. We're going to end up feeling bitter. And we're going to end up in a place where we just feel like there's no energy left. We need his dynamism. We need his Eden life. So in a moment, we're going to do that. The other thing is that we should be thinking about this in terms of sacrifice as well. Let me give you an example. Uh, one of the grace communities multiplied. We like to use that word. Um, and they, uh, they went from one to two. And um, up in the north of the city about a year and a half ago now. And um, at first it was painful for those who were in that group. Because what they realised was that they had this these great friendships and deep relationships with people um, but by becoming two they weren't going to see them the, the guys in the other group for uh, on, a, on a weekly basis like they used to and they weren't going to be able to pray together in the same way that they did they're not going to have as much time together and they really loved each other and so there's some people coming to me and saying oh, do we have to do this like this is really hard like i don't want to do this does that person have to go to that group can they come with us well, yeah, but actually, if we want to reach this city, if we want to reach different areas, we need to keep multiplying. And multiplying is often painful. Mission is often painful. You could say the same thing about giving. We've been talking about it in the last couple of weeks that as you give, it's, it can often be painful, even though you're doing it out of worship and generosity, it's, it's sometimes still painful. There's a kind of sacrifice to it. Mission, there is a sacrifice to mission. And Jesus, of course, is our ultimate uh, example. Even willing to go to the cross. And he says to us, take up your own cross and follow me. Are we doing that? Are we taking up our own cross and following him? Because at the heart of that is what it is to be truly human. A rediscovery of what it is to be human in Christ. And before we come to just spending some time in listening to God and praying together and asking the Spirit to come, I want to remind us that the measure that we have for this is not how successful we are in terms of numbers. Numbers of grace communities, number of congregations, number of people in the room. That's not the measure. Paul talks about how um, Paul, watered, uh, Paul planted and Apollos watered. Might be the other way around. Um, but God gives the growth. God gives the growth. It is God who builds his church. Our measure is what? Faithfulness. Our measure is to do what we are called to do. To be what God has given us to do, uh, to be. 
That is all we can do. And then we wait and we see what God does. We are made to multiply. We are made to be advancers of the kingdom of God on this earth. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has called us to that? Do you believe that in Jesus he's restoring that? And do you believe that one day he will return? So no matter what the numbers look like, no matter how hard it is, how is it that we can be sustained? Yes, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The other thing that will sustain us is that Christ is going to return. And that one day there will be a new creation that is Eden-like in every way. And it won't just be one area and that where we're supposed to then go out into dusty areas. There will be no more dusty areas. The barren lands will be gone. There will be a glorious fulfillment of Emmanuel, God with us, because he will be always with us and us with him. And we will enjoy what it is to be the people of God forever. Revelation 7, 9 says, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That is what Jesus, uh, what God, sorry, spoke to Abraham in Genesis 12. And that is what Jesus said in the Great Commission, fulfilled. It's going to happen. Jesus will return. He will claim every, every inch of the earth for himself. And this glorious new creation will be, it'll be a kind of recreation where all things are made new but with the same creation. And it's going to be glorious. It's going to be so good. It's going to be the best place that you have ever been and ever will be. And so we work now to show a glimpse of that here on the earth so that people might find hope and find in Jesus that they one day can be there because of what they see here. So the church is this outpost of this new creation to come. We are supposed to model something of what that looks like. That's what the mission of the church is about. It's not just a bunch of meetings. It's not a building. The church is a glimpse of the glory to come. It is the expansion of true life on the earth. It is what we are made for. So here's what we're going to do. And we're going to get on our feet. And if the band don't mind coming back up, we are going to spend some time just inviting the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us.